fluids are notoriously quite difficult to predict on what they are going to do or what they are going to be like after a certain amount of time uh this happens because fluids by nature are going to flow very haphazardly and uh, within themselves they carry a lot of physics uh in simpler terms uh, whatever force you may apply to the fluid it gets applied on all directions and it's quite difficult to predict on what is going to be along with that an added complexity is heat transfer within fluids so think of the uh, let's say solar air water heater or a geyser at your home when water is heated then this water is carried through the pipes uh, within the shower and inside the walls themselves and when this heat is transferred the pipes themselves may also get heated to a certain extent this is great for normal temperature this is great for uh, places like india mostly because there is not much of a temperature gradient between environment and inside the house but for cases such as let's say jammu and kashmir or cases such as upwards the north end of our earth in cases such as these the temperature outside uh, where the pipe is exposed to maybe below zero and if we are going to pass on very heated sort of fluid let's say we are transporting very hot water in such temperatures then this leads to a lot of internal stresses in the pipes themselves because the pipe is continuously going to try to expand as well as contract and one such uh, example case that we talk about is majorly going to be pipe flow for heat transfer because in many cases heat transfer is much more prevalent uh, for fluids when heat is being exchanged between the fluids and this happens usually through you know within our heat exchangers and what not so just to give you guys a context for that uh, we'll just start off with uh, what is heat transfer in fluids so today i'm going to cover certain basic <coughs> basic level concepts as well what is heat transfer and how does it apply to fluid flow what are the different forms of energy the first law of thermodynamics different modes of heat transfer then we'll briefly sort of touch upon what a specific application of uh, heat transfer which applies to batteries uh, how heat is generated in batteries and how to cool it so what is heat transfer uh heat essentially is measured by virtue of the travel of temperature uh, by temperature we mean a uh, simple concept of hot or cold when we look at it from a molecular point of view temperature essentially is a uh, you know velocity of molecules and ensemble collective large number of molecules when they move at a certain velocity then we say that the average kinetic energy that we carry with them is measured as temperature temperature is measured in our different units your degree celsius fahrenheit your kelvin and what not so for heat transfer we tend to look at the travel of this temperature from a point to point so basic requirement for heat transfer then becomes quite simple there should be difference in temperature from one point to another uh, for instance if you heat up a certain bar of uh, iron let's say and uh, you heat up just one end you can definitely feel that heat traveling to your hand over time since heat is conducted through that bar and it reaches you in very little time now heat transfer problem when we want to study them from an engineering perspective this can be classified into two sort of problems there is rating and sizing what do we mean by rating uh, for any existing system that is out there we want to understand how much heat is being transferred so that we are able to rate that particular system saying that in that system this amount of rate uh, this amount of heat is going to be transferred for this amount of time and uh, for these properties whereas for sizing problem we essentially mean that i want to attain certain amount of heat transfer rate for that what should be the size of my system uh this becomes a simple case then for example if you want if there is a room let's say uh 12 by 12 by 12 by, uh, feet a simple cubic room and uh, you simply want to understand ki to cool this particular room what is the amount of uh, what is the size of my fan that would be required let's say that becomes a sizing problem uh whereas if i already have a fan and uh, it is present in that particular room then if i do the analysis on how much is it going to cool 
for an amount of time that becomes a rating problem it's as simple as that but uh, the type of analysis we do for both is a bit different in one we are estimating or we are solving for heat transfer rate in the other we are trying to estimate or come up with the size of that system itself now heat transfer can be studied through uh, two different means one is experimental and one is analytical these are pretty standard across the board for any such uh, physics or sciences the major drawback for experimental study is that uh, it takes up a lot of time to set up such studies as well as there's a lot of cost also involved since uh, any study that needs to be conducted there needs to be a scalability test in that you need to keep on iterating over designs and find the best possible fit for you uh, the major advantage for experimental analysis is that uh, there is no other alternative to actually understanding the accuracy of a study because if any study is not replicable in real physical world then it may or may not be accurate enough next is analytical in this we are uh, talking about computational fluid dynamics for our purposes but any mathematical analysis that can be done using software tools comes under analytical analysis so software packages such as your ansys uh, open foam your ansys ice pack and what not all of these come under analytical tools where we can numerically and computationally simulate the real physical world problem in our computer and try to run it with different different cases major advantage being that uh, it's quite fast in how quickly we can do the analysis and come up with a test design now let's talk about the different types of heat and energy we'll dive a bit deeper into it so when we talk about heat the concept of internal energy comes in uh, internal energy essentially is the energy that any uh, sum of matter actually possesses within it without any external influences so all the molecules in a particular system let's say a simple let's take a simple balloon then the sum of kinetic and potential energies of the molecules inside that balloon will uh, contribute to us that internal energy stating that in that particular point of time the balloon or the molecules within that balloon contain this much amount of energy uh, as a given and any external influences are only, uh, are only going to add up to this internal energy or take away from it uh, this internal energy is uh, related to intermolecular forces there are a lot of uh, collisions that happen as well as a lot of molecular vibrations that also happen these contribute to the internal energy along with internal energy there is also sensible energy this is a part of the internal energy of a system which is related to more of molecules uh, kinetic energy this we call it sensible since this is uh, the type of energy that is most utilizable or this is the one that we can use the most uh when we talk about heat the gas equation comes into play gas equation essentially talks about uh, the different properties of a fluid or a gas are going to be related to each other through this relation so the uh, product of pressure times volume would be equal to a gas constant times temperature uh this is a pretty standard ideal gas equation it's not really applicable to real world gases because the real world gases uh, behave a bit differently and the gas equation that we use for those are a bit corrected for different different brackets of temperature pressure and volumes but for the intents and purposes of just studying uh, and doing analytical analysis uh, we consider a lot of cases for a gas to be ideal because it just makes our life easy and uh, it simplifies the problem a lot then there is specific heat uh, specific heat essentially is uh, the energy required to raise the temperature of a unit mass uh, by 1 degree celsius so why are we interested in specific heat it's quite simple uh, we want to measure how much heat or how much energy do we need to expend to raise the temperature by 1 degree so that we have a measure or we are able to Uh, better come up with the resources and increase the temperature by whatever degree we want uh then in thermodynamics the specific heat that we are studying are focused on two parts there is specific heat at constant volume and specific heat at constant pressure i do want to ask all of you uh can anybody tell me why are we studying specific heat at constant volume and at constant pressure first of all 
uh, what is the need for a constant volume anybody okay can you elaborate sagar okay great anybody else again question is quite simple i want to understand why are we studying specific heat at constant volume why constant volume all right okay so it's quite simple uh, we want to understand for a control uh, volume let's say there is a system in which my volume is not going to change at all i just want to understand what is the amount of heat i want to uh, give to raise the temperature exactly if volume is constant then uh, there might be changes within the matter itself i want to study in such cases where my if my matter is not going to change then what will be the impact of that on the heat required it's as simple as that so take up a simple example of let's say uh, your piston cylinder then in a piston cylinder if uh, a certain fluid is taken let's say you are filling the entire cylinder with a liquid and the volume is locked uh, to that particular volume and you have held the piston quite forcibly then if you increase the temperature of that system what are the implications of that exactly so much for a closed system great we have a lot of engineers in our audience today great feels great and vice versa for specific heat at constant pressure all right um then we want to understand uh you know how heat transfer is happening over a cross section as well uh your capital q is used to denote amount of heat transfer during a process and uh, small q is heat transfer per unit area both of these are important since for many heat transfer problems we want to understand over a cross section how much heat has been transferred because in majority of cases heat is lost or gained through surfaces and uh, over that surface what is the heat transfer is the major sort of metric we want to study <clears throat> uh next is the boring part the first law of thermodynamics i'll try not to take much of your time but i do want all of you to understand first law of thermodynamics is quite simple here it talks about uh conservation of energy or uh, transfer of energy from one form to another essentially means that if i give energy to a system that energy will be translated uh to the system and it will leave in one form or another so for instance if i hit a ball then i've given it some form of kinetic energy let's say then that energy will be lost due to air friction due to friction uh, between ball and the ground and over time due to gravity it will you know keep hitting the uh, keep hitting the ground and after a certain amount of time it will stop so what has happened to the entire energy energy has been transferred to the ball and through the ball it has transferred to you know friction between molecules both in air and in ground so that's first law of thermodynamics for you uh, total energy entering the system uh, minus total energy leaving the system is equal to change in the total energy of the system is there any difference between first law and conservation of uh, these are derived from each other but the conservation uh, of energy that you talk about for fluids is a bit different uh, so these are derived from each other is what i would say anand because uh, when you look at first law of thermodynamics it is more of a holistic view or a bird's eye view of what's happening to the energy which is the same principle we apply to a fluid so in a control volume any energy that is given to the fluid is something that leaves out of that system or is translated from one point to another so internal energy change due to any source term or internal energy change due to viscosity or any pressure uh that may lead to sort of a kinetic or potential energy changes between 
or within that fluid control volume are all accounted for. So I would say the first law of thermodynamics is the base for the conservation law of energy for your fluids. All right. I hope that answers the question. Um, next is the modes of heat transfer. So this I am sure all of you are aware of, but I just want to reiterate. Uh, conduction, it's the simple uh, transfer of heat between molecules. This is vibration of molecules. This is primarily used as a term for solids since molecules are more closely packed and the vibrations are much more translatable. Uh, whereas convection, it is much more prevalent or a term used for fluids since uh, the vibration of molecules is uh, not as much prevalent, whereby the uh, vibrations of internal molecules of the fluids themselves are not going to collide in the same fashion as they do with conduction. But regardless, uh, convection only happens as a combined effect produced by conduction and fluid motion. You always need a solid medium to transfer heat uh, from uh, the solid to fluid. Then there is radiation. Radiation is electromagnetic waves. Uh, think of the greatest example there is sun. Uh, there is no medium between us and sun, whereas, uh, but still we can feel the heat of the sun when we are standing outside on this in the sunlight. So these are your simple electromagnetic waves or photons which occur and uh, they do not require any medium for travel. So this is a good example that I like to give for heat transfer. Uh, take a simple ball, put water in it and you heat it, then what is going to happen? First, the heat is transferring from flame to the surface, the solid surface. And uh, through this solid surface, heat is going to get convected or conducted to the fluid. And within the fluid, between layers of the fluid, the heat is going to be convected. Now, what do we mean by that? We essentially mean that when heat is being uh, conducted to the base of this ball, the temperature of this base of the ball is going to increase. And by virtue of that, the first layer in contact with this base is going to get excited or the temperature of that is going to increase, which in turn will, uh, by virtue of density changes, uh, increase the turbulence or sort of uh, random nature of fluid motion within the ball itself. And as it does, heat is going to be transferred within the fluid. So when we talk about heat transfer again, and not just in which medium it is getting transferred, we also want to uh, talk about what state is it going to get transferred in. There is steady state. We essentially talk about over a long period of time, how much heat uh, transfer is going to occur and how much will it equalize, for instance. Uh, let's take heat conduction through walls of a building on a winter day. If the outside temperature is kept at 3 degrees Celsius and inside to, uh, 20 degrees Celsius, then over time, if this temperature is kept uniform, 3 degrees Celsius, then what is the heat transfer that is going to happen perpetually? So inside, the temperature is going to be lost to outside and this wall, this gradient is going to be maintained always. So middle of the wall, it's 11. Uh, end of the wall is 3, beginning of the wall is 20. That's the whole idea. Whereas there is your lumped system. In lumped system, we talk about how heat is going to be uniform all across the board because this is it becomes easier for us to study such a system. For example, if we take a simple iron ball and we heat it up, then we are not really interested in how temperature is distributed inside the entire ball. Rather, we say that the entire ball possesses that heat. Next is unsteady heat generation. Uh, whereas unlumped system or not a lumped system can be something like meat, let's say. Where we talk about if the outer surface of that meat is heated up to some 100 degrees Celsius, inside uh, the meat block, heat is not going to be conducted. And we cannot really say the entire block of that meat is kept at same temperature. Similarly, there is a unsteady state uh, for example, simple battery heat generation. So batteries are always going to be uh, kept in a pack. And uh, this battery pack is always, you know, uh, going to be uh, the energy within this battery pack is going to be removed perpetually because we need this energy for several other purposes. So as we take out 
electrical energy from these batteries heat is being generated and this heat generation is always going to be unsteady because we are only going to choose certain sectors from which we need uh, energy at a time uh, this comes under your battery management system that is how you increase longevity of your batteries and whatnot we'll come to that in just a while but the idea is your heat generation is going to change or vary with time uh, next is quite simple i want to explain the formula for conduction uh, conduction as i explained is a simple phenomenon heat transfer uh, energy transfer from high energy particles to low energy particles it can take place in solids liquids and gases alike because conduction by definition of physics it's a uh, vibrational collisions between molecules uh, conduction is dependent on a lot of factors mainly we talk about geometry material uh, thickness temperature the uh, cross sectional area and what not all of these are major factors which uh, you know increase or decrease your heat conduction then k that you see right here k is the thermal conductivity the constant this is a sort of a constant number for each material that is out there uh, this is measured in uh, what per meter degree celsius so it's a measure of materials ability to store thermal energy as you can see from left to right as uh, we move on from matter to matter starting with gases then liquids then all the solids and the non-metallic crystals are the highest these materials are going to hold your heat for a longer time or they will conduct your heat uh, quite quickly when compared to your gases insulators and liquids next is your convection uh, convection is the mode of uh, transfer of energy between solids and liquids we talk about any boundary that is being heated then we want to study what is the impact of that on the fluid surrounding it so convection is essentially a combined effect of both conduction and fluid motion so we want to understand when heat for instance if we have a simple fan and a hot plate and we are pushing air onto this hot plate then what happens so this hot block is going to be at a certain temperature when we look at velocity profile of a uh, fluid that is flowing over this particular hot plate it will look kind of like this because fluid will want to stick near the boundary and uh, as subsequent layers move uh, away from the wall the velocity is going to reach at uh, you know v infinity or free stream velocity after your boundary thickness has been reached 0.99 u infinity at that particular point uh, we can very well see the temperature variation of the fluid away from the wall as we go near the wall the temperature again increases so this becomes the concept of your you know hydrodynamic boundary layer versus thermal boundary layer and uh, this is a much you know uh, studied sort of phenomena because we want to understand how efficiently or how effectively heat is being transmitted from one point to another by the fluid and this is most important because through this phenomena we effectively tell or talk about efficiency of that heat transfer system or a heat exchanger we talk about the heat transfer coefficient through this phenomena uh, there's a very good uh, non dimensional number that is associated with this phenomena can anybody tell me there's a good non dimensional number that is associated with hydrodynamic and thermodynamic boundary layer it's called a number i hope all of you remember your engineering basics great it's not reynolds number it's not okay okay it's not reynolds number guys great yeah, it's prandtl number yeah yeah it's prandtl number great good job all right let's quickly move on so how do we measure convection uh newton as is with everything every single thing that he has invented also gave a formula for you know convection as well so newton talks about 
the rate of convection heat transfer is proportional to difference in temperature and fluids also but the uh, constant that we talk about the convection heat transfer coefficient that differs uh, between fluids and uh, solids this is measured in watt per meter square degree celsius where it is much more dependent on surface area and uh, this ts is the surface temperature or the boundary temperature uh, near which the fluid is going to flow t infinity is the free stream temperature in many cases this is a reference temperature that is also taken i would highly urge that all of you go through and understand for different cases what is the reference temperature that is taken especially for cases such as your heat exchangers right great now uh, we have spoken about a lot of boring stuff about theory behind what is heat transfer first law thermodynamics thermodynamics what is specific heat types of heat transfer what not what not what not now let's come to the application part so why exactly are we studying heat transfer one very good example in today's day and age is battery packs since the uh, world is trying to move more and more towards automotive domain is trying to more uh, move and uh, move more and more towards electric vehicles and uh, we want to move towards electric because it's seen as one of those sustainable ways in which we can reduce our carbon emissions a lot of work needs to be done in that area where you know we need efficient ways of uh, making our battery packs as well as uh, efficient or effective ways to reduce carbon emissions through manufacturing of evs as well because manufacturing of evs does not mean we have completely eliminated emissions we have just offset it from one point to another it's much more efficient than your uh, petroleum or uh, conventional fuel sort of uh, vehicles because the energy that comes to battery packs comes from uh, your huge power generation plants even if it comes from a coal generation plant the energy efficiency that a coal generation uh, coal powered uh, thermal plant is going to uh, offer is going to be much more than a simple you know petroleum based car still we need a lot of research we need to offset a lot of things and uh, we are miles away but we need to be prepared for when it comes so why are we studying batteries and that too for heat transfer uh, the reason is quite simple so as we give energy to batteries or as we take energy away from the batteries these batteries are going to get hot i am sure all of you have uh, experienced this if you are using your phone for a longer time or if you are playing pubg for a long time let's say if you are using uh, watching videos for a longer time your phone is going to use up a lot of energy and uh, during that time it is going to draw more energy from your batteries which in turn is going to increase the temperature of that battery for such cases where the system is quite small and uh, it can lose temperatures to surroundings it's a great thing we don't need to really cool it because it's not a danger to anybody and it will not impact the longevity of the device as well for a sufficient amount of time let's say but same is not the case for uh, an electric vehicle a car a bike or what not because the amount of energy we take away uh, to run the motor for such vehicles is quite huge and uh, this can very significantly ramp up the temperature of that particular vehicle and for such cases we actively need to cool the batteries otherwise it may lead to a catastrophe i'm sure a uh, few of you might have noticed uh, this was being uh, you know uh, published in the news and what not where in a lot of cases where uh, the electric vehicle bikes were kept outside in summer uh, especially in the northern regions of india the batteries caught fire because the manufacturers they did not account for battery cooling systems and for such cases the batteries reached the threshold and uh, came to what is known as battery thermal runway what that is and uh, why this heat is generated we'll explore in the upcoming slides this is a simple lithium ion battery uh, there is your current collector versus your current uh, sorry these are the two current collectors there is your anode and cathode uh, negative electrode is always going to be anode positive electrode is always going to be cathode the current is going to move from negative to positive where essentially we are talking about the uh, increase 
of electrons in one area are going to flow from that are going to increase the potential of the load or going to run the load and after that they are going to go away into the positive side there is always going to be a flow between positive side and negative side by virtue of the type of materials that we are choosing between the two sides uh this is as simple as it gets in explaining what a battery sort of looks like the negative electrode is often a metal or an alloy and many times it's hydrogen also during discharge this becomes anode then at the same time for positive electrode this is a metal oxide uh, oxide because this has already reached the amount of or it has already fulfilled the amount of electrons that are required to be in it uh, and during discharge this is cathode then uh, the part or the partition between the two this is the medium for ion transfer this is called electrolyte and uh, there is a separator in between as well which electrically isolates the positive and negative electrodes this uh, separator is there so that you know there is no self discharge between the two this is a, a typical walkthrough of what a lithium ion battery sort of looks like now current collectors towards the end these are the bridging components these collect the current and connect them with the external circuits these are usually made out of your aluminium or copper foils for you know cathodes and anodes respectively uh, let's go through bit of terminology as well uh, cell is the smallest individual unit uh, one cell uh, that you can see then battery is a group of such cells cell voltage depends on the combination of active chemicals that are being used for example your nickel based your nickel cadmium or, or nickel metal hydride these are approximately 1.2 volts then cell capacity this is the uh, quantity of charge in ampere hours that the battery can hold at a certain time c rate this is a relative measure of cell current it is constant current charge or discharge that cell can sustain for one hour then energy is the uh, sort of uh, energy that a cell can store which can be released later to work and the rate at which energy is released is measured in watt or kilowatt we can connect the cells uh, in series or pa parallel to make them a battery pack uh, advantages for both disadvantages for both are kept here very simple uh, for series the sum of individual cell voltages will be the battery voltage the capacity or the amperage will be the same the battery can uh, let's say we have three volt uh, batteries and five of them uh, and uh, 20 amp power capacity batteries are kept in series the voltage of it will become 15 volts and uh, the capacity will remain at 20 ampere hour and the energy capacity for the total battery pack is going to be 300 watt hour or 300 watt hour energy can be transferred uh, through this battery pack uh, whereas when we keep it in parallel the capacity is sum of the cell uh, you know uh, this is the capacity of the cell to provide this energy for one hour the battery will have voltage of three volts only and uh, the full capacity is going to be sum of the 500 ampere and the energy capacity or the rate at which the energy can be expended or removed from this pack will be 300 watt hour uh, the idea is quite simple uh, voltage is the measure of potential or the amount of electrons that can be sent from one point to another this is a uh, uh, you know a quantity that is quite important to run whatever system we want so in cases where we need higher voltage the cells are kept in series and for cases where we need longevity or the capacity needs to be high but we are not bothered about voltage is where we can keep the cells in parallel now to the major topic at hand why exactly do batteries get hot um it is again explained quite simply through any electrical system so in many times in news we see that there has been a short circuit and it led to you know fire and there's been a electric short circuit which led to you know house fire and uh, entire house burned down why is that the case uh, 
it is the case because due to the voltage fluctuations or due to increased voltage through certain rated insulated wires there will always be internal resistance within the wire which is carrying electricity no matter which material it is made out of the metal let's say copper is always going to have some amount of resistance towards uh, flow of electrons this resistance then generates heat due to the i square r losses and uh, due to these losses heat of that particular system or wire will be increased same is translatable to batteries since batteries are individual components of different different materials and through these materials we are moving our electrons from one point to another when we are moving electrons from one point to another due to internal resistance within the battery the heat is going to increase this phenomenon is called joule heating and uh, while discharging essentially the battery uh, will be at a certain limit at uh, essentially how much energy can it expend at some uh, certain time now uh, during charging uh, there is you know uh, no limit as to how much energy we can give to those batteries so need to be careful when we are charging the batteries as well so internal resistance can happen at both charging and discharging but it is much more prevalent or much more important during discharging because while a system is running it shouldn't be the case that it is catching on fire so that's the whole idea behind why batteries are going to catch fire so what's the solution then uh, it's quite simple we need to cool the said batteries though how do we cool it then comes the conversation of cooling them using fluids by either forced convection or natural convection so what is forced convection it's quite simple again we are going to send fluid towards the batteries at a certain velocity uh, and then we expect that heat will be carried uh, through this fluid and it will take that heat away from the batteries so battery manufacturers always try to keep the internal resistance of the cells as low as possible but it's not uh it's really impossible to make the internal resistance zero there are cases where internal resistance is zero it's called superconductivity uh, if you guys are aware please look into the concept it's quite cool is there any problem if we put our mobile for charging for entire night uh great question i'll answer why so within each battery pack uh there is always the danger of it catching on fire so to circumvent that we need to regulate the voltages properly how do we regulate voltages for that we need uh, microcontrollers we need processors and a smart enough program or a piece of software that will make sure that your voltage is regulated and if the temperature is increasing then in such case the voltage or the power needs to be cut off uh such a system is called the battery management system or battery thermal management system in which uh, the individual components can be thought of as a simple temperature sensor a simple you know voltmeter and what not so looking at a certain sector or let's say the amount of these cells within the battery if the temperature within this sector increases to above 35 40 degrees celsius then this is a point of major concern so what btms will do is first it will identify that the temperature has increased through a temperature sensor and it will run through a software piece of software saying that if the temperature has increased then what do we do then there are set cases where the uh, current passage through this sector is going to be stopped uh, where it can be charging or discharging and uh, will be taken away from other sectors where temperature is quite normal so that allowing this particular sector to lose heat to outside world as well as for cases where forced convection is uh, available or a fan is available to cool up these uh, batteries then the average temperature of the battery pack can be measured quite quickly and if the temperature reaches a certain threshold then active cooling can be implemented to reduce the temperature of the entire battery all right uh pcb cooling i'll i'll come to that what well, if we have enough time i'll come to that no issues all right so for such a case where you know batteries may get heated to a certain extent the conversation then becomes how do we make the system now this becomes uh you know 
in the beginning we spoke about design uh, problem versus rating problem sizing problem versus rating problem uh, this is quite analogous to that we want to understand what is the size of cooling that is required and what is the rate of cooling that is required for such a system so then comes the conversation of what is the type of fluid that we want to choose given that uh, if heat transfer is quite high then we can very well choose liquids since liquids have higher heat retaining capacity than gases as we saw previously in thermal conductivity plot then at the same time what fluid can be the best choice for such a case for instance if the fluid is toxic then it cannot be used for commercial usage if the fluid is uh, cheap enough for us to use in multiple such systems so this becomes again a scalability problem as well along with that what is the optimum heat transfer coefficient that needs to be given or that needs to be attained by that particular liquid because we don't want to freeze we don't want the liquid to freeze within the battery pack because that would be highly you know inefficient and very problematic for our batteries so batteries just like human beings do not like extreme temperatures they do not operate well in low temperatures as well because at uh, below zero the uh, electrolyte inside batteries start to crystallize so there is that so for our intents and purposes the fluid needs to be just the right fit which you know doesn't solidify doesn't evaporate and carries enough heat so that heat is transferred efficiently so yeah the objective then becomes quite simple it is to protect the battery from overheating we need to monitor the temperature and interrupt the current uh, pack where the temperature has increased then we need to dissipate uh, the said surplus amount of heat by allowing for uh, active or passive cooling techniques we need to remove uh, heat so that higher currents can be carried so uh, i'm sure all of you are aware of uh, you know oneplus the brand so oneplus brand it has done the supercharging uh, available uh, how do, how does it do it so the idea is uh, that uh, they send in some 20 amps of current to your mobile battery and want to charge your mobile battery entirely within 30 40 minutes let's say how does that happen uh, again uh, there are certain ways in which the heat uh, is being offset so uh, oneplus is going to look at or the software engineers within that company are going to look at how the heating cycle sort of looks like when we increase the amount of current and they're going to uh, give that current in pulses in that the amount of current will not always be constant it will always be dwindling between a certain value high value to low value so as to allow your mobile device to lose heat naturally uh why is this important it's very important because you know uh since we really want to move towards electric vehicles as our future in such cases we want to uh, reduce the amount of time it takes to charge our electric vehicles because uh, when you look at your simple petroleum car uh, all you have to do is wait for 5 minutes the petrol pump guy is going to fill it up and you are on your way but if you have to wait for 30 40 minutes for your battery to be charged then this becomes an inconvenience in how you are going to travel especially for cases where you know if we are going to make trucks out of your electric vehicles then a lot of transportation problems will come into play where a lot of packages or a lot of goods will be delayed and what not so for such cases we want to monitor the temperature of battery packs and we want to maintain it at a normal or nominal temperature so that higher amount of currents can be carried along with that we also want to ensure that uh, there are no localized hotspots why do we need that it's simple because when there is a localized sort of increase in temperature let's say in this particular region if the temperature has increased to a sufficient amount let's say 60 degrees celsius then this particular battery is in the uh, range where it may explode or it may uh the material which is encapsulating your lithium ion or the lithium element may you know be damaged and may expose lithium to outside air once lithium is exposed to outside air it really really wants to react with oxygen and wants to explode so localized hotspot are a no go along with that 
one major manufacturing problem is there should be no additional weight or there should not be uh, this should not be a certain payload that needs to be uh, hauled by your vehicle so that you know the weight can be expended for other payload or for you know the customer's need or whatnot because if we are going to use uh, for a 1000 kg vehicle if we are going to use 500 kg cooling system then it doesn't really make sense all right